Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Tech to Transform, the Mantis podcast. Following our acquisition by our new parent company, Ruda Finn, Eleanor Willock talks to Managing Director Nick Leonard. They discuss agency management, what they can learn from their colleagues and clients, how working in medtech and the public sector motivates them, and how faxing should make a return to media relations. Take a listen. Hello, welcome to episode 11 of the Mantis Tech to Transform podcast. I'm Eleanor Willock, the Managing Director at Mantis, and I have a very special guest with me today. It's Nick Leonard, who's the Managing Director of Ruda Finn, who is now my colleague. Hello, Nick. Hello, Eleanor. Our colleague again. Yes. All right. Colleague again. So second after, time. After a 20 year hiatus. Yes. Things look no different. No, not at all. <laughs> it's brilliant to have you on this at uh, the podcast. It's the first we're recording since our acquisition by Rudafin. And um, we've got tons to talk about. And we thought we'd use this opportunity to uh, let our listeners, so our, our teams and our clients and anybody else out there who's listening, get to know uh, Nick and I a bit more. And um, we're going to talk a bit about um, things that our agencies have in common, why it was a brilliant idea to come together like this and um, talk about our, uh, our clients and um, the way we like to do things. So um, I've got a couple of questions for Nick. I think he's got a couple of questions for me. So, Nick, I wanted to ask you, uh, given, as you um, so kindly mentioned, that it's been a mere 20 years since we last worked together, um, and you've been an agency lead for a, a, fair, a fair bit of time now, what do you think has changed um, about being an agency lead in the last couple of years? Um, what have you found challenging and what's been the most fun bit? Uh, I can only really speak from my perspective in terms of here at Rudy Finn mm-hmm. and also working with a US team and what I see in clients. But um, I think there's one obvious thing that's changed in the last couple of years, mm-hmm. um, which is the pandemic, um, right. which it's only taken us literally two minutes before we mention it. With I know. it. Um, but um, it has completely changed how things, um, how we approach things and what we do. So um, I think there are two areas where um, I've definitely had to adapt and change um, the way that I do things. So the first one is in trust. Mm -hmm. I think um, when you lead an agency, often, you know, you're having to make decisions, you work with your management team to do that, but trust now has to spread throughout the organization. I know you're, you've always been a virtual organization, right? So you have that almost um, intrinsic within your team from the start, but with us, we've had to adapt. We had to trust people to work um, wherever they are, um and to completely change and adapt to new working patterns and processes and to get work done if you don't see it that was the biggest thing for me i'm a i'm very much um someone who likes going into the office so mm-hmm. um work happening without me seeing it does it even happen it's like that is it the japanese mm-hmm. proverb i don't know or whatever it is um but that's had to be um a big thing for me to kind of um not be so controlling and think about, um, you know, uh, and, to, and to adapt to, 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 to people getting things done without, without me being there. So that's the first one. And it's very alliterative because the other one is a T as well, which is transparency. So we, yeah. at the start of the pandemic, um, I sent an email to clients basically saying, um, we're all going to start working from home now. So uh, we will uh, keep you updated, but we should be back in the office in two weeks. <laughs> um and you know almost two years later here we are so um at the start of that process what we found was that people were very um a little bit insecure um a little bit worried about what was going to happen in the world to their job Mm -hmm. their clients to us as an agency so we've opened up and i used to hold a lot of the information and uh, about the company just within a select group of people Mm -hmm. maybe because i didn't want to you know, um, burden people with it, or I thought it was confidential, um, or, you know, was worried about a lack of context. Yeah. But we started from the very start to be really open about where we were going, monthly kind of revenue figures, everything down to even cash flow, because 
you know, when people are looking at the news and seeing what's going on, they're seeing companies, you know, running out of money mm-hmm. and having to let people go. And we wanted to show people that we were a strong going concern, that we were going to ride this out, that we were we were fine and they shouldn't worry too much. So mm-hmm. we opened up everything and, and trusted them with um, receiving that information and using it in the right way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In some ways, it's a little bit like, being what being a client might feel like the first part of what you said the whole trusting that the work's being done if you can't see it being done I guess I imagine some clients especially when you're working internationally when they're not seeing constant updates some clients prefer constant updates some don't it you know you have to trust your agency a lot don't you so I I guess as an agency lead you've almost moved into that client role where you're seeing people less often seeing their outputs and and trusting that that's what was required yeah i think particularly when you're working internationally there may be you know across time zones there may be parts of your day where your agency isn't even awake or your client isn't even awake Mm -hmm. so you have to trust that work is going to get done in the background and yeah it is a shift in mindset for me i've always been for the 20 30 years whatever i've been doing this um always been in an office with Mm -hmm. people you know going into meeting rooms for meeting collaborating um actually in person yeah rather than going out and 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 doing it at home I work from home rarely usually I used Mm -hmm. to um Mm -hmm. but now I've actually had to adapt the way that I work to um to 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 make sure that I can function in this way because I I've realized during this pandemic that I get a lot of my energy from people um from being around people for interacting actually really taken you you personally that to realize that you like being around people yeah, well, really? yeah, like, I like I like to think I'm a little bit I'm quite self aware, but clearly not because I didn't realise until that point that that was the reason I used to do it. It wasn't just out of habit turning up every day to an office. It was actually because I liked the the dynamic of different things every day, different interactions with people, um, mm. and and actually, as I said, getting my energy from 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 that uh, from that interaction. Now you're a kinetic person. I would have thought of you as always somebody who you need to be around people to, to yeah. get that. But energy. now I've had to basically get it through this Mm, um which is yeah um which is different but um but you know we're starting to go back now we're 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 in the office more regularly you know we're we're um, we're letting people go in pretty much when they want to Mm -hmm. Uh, and then from the start of next year um i think there'll be more and more people there and i'll be turning up to the office more and and Mm -hmm. and uh, and working with people in that way because i don't want to lose that I mean, it's very easy to fall into a system where you you know don't have to commute for an hour each way every day. But I don't want to lose that. I think it's a really important part of the the way that I work and and the thing I enjoy about work. Well, what's certain, and it's why you know Mantis in the end took the office in Bristol for a couple of days a week, is that you can't possibly uh, succession plan an agency, build an agency build people um, from the start of their PR careers without there being some one-on-one involvement. You just can't expect it. It's not fair to expect people who are at the beginning of their careers to learn just from you and I on, on this screen. It can't happen. No, it's um, true. The only- I, I, would ask, I was going to ask you actually, Anna, just in, on that um, respect, you've always been kind of a virtual agency and a, a, an agency where you've got people working from wherever they want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, now everyone's doing it. Now mm-hmm. everyone's, you know, claiming to be the experts in the, the in this in this field and talking about mm-hmm. you know the benefits of hybrid working. They've just discovered it. How does that make you feel? Um. Well, at the start of the pandemic, it made me feel relieved that as people were struggling to even get the right kit to work from home, the Monday after the Friday, they were told not to come to the office that it really was just another day at the office for us. Um, So I was relieved from a logistical perspective. Um, I was, I mean, the the added issue, of course, for parents like you and I was added kids and added husband or wife or partner or whatever, being in the same house. I mean, we've, you know, we've all got people at different stages of their lives in in our business um, and and as clients and, there's no one person has had it harder or easier than anybody else. Um, you know, if I look back to us 20 years ago, we were all in house shares, weren't we, when, when we were working together? I, we've, got, we've had team members who were doing their jobs in a six-person house share. That must have been as hard as doing it with two children under eight. 
Um, the thing that, you know, frustratingly, um, the thing that you allude to, that uh, it's, you know, the, the great panacea to keeping everyone healthy and happy is hybrid working. And, that every, you know, there's no, there's no sort of me too element for it for us. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't ever shout about the fact that we were one of the original PR companies to be like this. Um, but I think what we just we, did, we just did it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but what I would say is for our team as a whole going forward is that I hope that Mantis plus Ruda Finn now for both clients and staff and anybody else involved with working with us will get a really solid feel of what's possible and what culture can be built from, from um, relationships that predominantly are built with some face-to-face -face interaction, but, but mostly working tightly together within our own environments. And I'm not even gonna say our own homes because we have worked literally everywhere. I pitched an account last year, sat in a paddling pool with my kids playing in it and we still won it. It is possible, anyone, anyone could have done it. I'm not saying I'm special on that, but, um, you know, we when you've got confidence in what you're saying and, and 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 the industry that you work in, where you work and who you work with are important but not essential. Yeah. Right, let's let's move on from this now and let's okay. talk about us because obviously we've come together as companies <coughs> into one. Yeah. Um, because there's synergies there because there's mm -hmm. things that we do which complement each other and I think the, the key to that is the industries in which we work so the clients that we have and the, 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 the areas of specialism we have so you know I really get enthused by that um, by the clients that we have and and the, and the things that we do for them um, what do you think why does, does, does that the same for you why do you think that we're working in such a exciting space well, because we're moving the needle, I think constantly we're bringing things that the people of the world globally need to know about and should know about that empowers them to do what they can do. We're lucky. We work with the most incredible health um, healthcare provider in, in the world. The NHS is unique and, um, yes, has some, some ongoing since it started issues, which it will always have. But it never ceases to amaze me how... Um, it functions and excels and delivers despite every sort of threat it could possibly face. Um, I think uh, when it comes to my origins, which effectively were crisis management and then tech PR, you need to be able to believe in what you're talking about, what you're communicating. And um, there does come a point with, you know, or there perhaps did come a point with me where I would be wondering what needle it was I was moving and what the point of it was sometimes with some uh, some clients that I'd worked with in, in the past. The, the, the clients that we work with now change lives in some way. Um, they're not... Um, they're not all the same, but they all bring a positive effect on us as citizens or or people that really, really need it. And they help people like the police and um, government civil servants and diplomats and uh, hospital consultants do things better. And that's really important to me um, and always has been, really. I think that's that's the, the, the thing which I found the biggest change, the most striking change when I could join Rudifim. So I used to work, obviously, as you know, in enterprise tech mm. uh, for years. And I think that's great in terms of the things that enterprise tech can enable. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. How it, how it moves business on uh, and how it delivers efficiencies and how it makes more things effective. And at the end of the thing, you get you could get a really good benefit. But I think when you're welcoming in healthcare and, and, and around healthcare, the, the, the benefit is for humanity, really, yeah. is for... Um, you're, you're, you are, as we, and it's a cliche, but you're improving and, or contributing to improving and saving lives. Absolutely. So, you know, when we work with AstraZeneca and internal comms, the whole team really, um, it's not just they're a client and we do the work for them. The whole team, you know, absolutely gets immersed in, in what they're doing and, and feels um, really proud of, mm. of the outputs, the end, end results that the company achieves. It's, it's a different type of relationship that you have with your client. Yeah. I, yes, it is. And um, the public sector tech landscape really does attract some incredible talent 
not just from the tech side of building their businesses but also from the the sales and marcom side as well and the research side and we work with lots and i know you do lots of clinicians lots of um clinical safety officers things like that it's there's never a dull moment and um when you get an rfp and that's um for a technology that makes you just think god that is so cool you know well, that's the word I was trying to avoid using at the start because I'm pushing 50 and I've just moved deeper into suburbia. So I don't I know. think really I can define what cool is, but um, no. but, but it's absolutely true. You look at some of the stuff that, that your clients are doing, you just think, wow. Yeah. How is that even possible? I always feel like that when I see um, supercomputers. They're my, like If I had to say something that I think I will never fail to be amazed at, it is they, the sight of a massive computer, supercomputer at work on site you know, finding a cure for cancer, any kind of algorithmic stuff. They're just amazing. You must have loved working with IBM then. Oh God, I did. That was my, um, in the States, that was the, the, the biggest account that I led was the, um, well, it was called grid computing then. And um, system, there was System X, System Z, all the big servers. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. <laughs> Such a loser. Um, so, yeah, um, I think... Um, I think it's really changed the way I look at the world. I'm certainly, and maybe like we're the same age, maybe it's an age thing, but I get, actually, no, it's not an age thing. Because one thing that the Mantosians definitely have in common is we're all the same. We all get angry um, about the same injustices and the same public sector um, issues. We see it in the same way, in a non-political way, because obviously everybody has their own political views, but, you know, funding, government funding for things gets us all talking um and um i think what i look for what we all look for in a staff member a new st- a new team member is somebody who can take those issues who looks at our industry space and sees something other than the politics just sees the the way that the public sector and, and the healthcare landscape molds society and culture what do you think what what do you think is missing from our, our comms, comms discipline what would you change uh, about comms I think I'd change <laughs> right from the get-go right from the, the first part of my career I would change other people's attitudes to it people outside the industry's attitudes to it um, it used to make me very angry that um, it wasn't seen as a profession in the same way as other professions are seen I think that's changing Uh, it's certainly changing um, at a more senior level but I think it's a serious career for some for really highly talented people and it doesn't get the attention that it should in that way I mean the degree in it didn't really even exist when I did a degree so I couldn't point to that as being a subject that I would have chosen to do Um, but I feel like uh I feel like we are taken more seriously on a board level now, certainly in the public sector, um, in across government, local government, NHS trusts, the head of comms now has a seat at the exec table, which is a huge improvement. Um, Would it was so with some of the CIOs and CTIOs, it might make the public sector's life a little bit easier. But for comms especially, uh, I feel like uh, I would change our reputation and I'd probably change the uh, <sighs> propensity for dragging us that some aspects of the media still have as well, the way we're referred to. I don't think it's changed. I do think it's changed over the years, though. I think when we started way back... Um, people didn't know what PR and comms were Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. or what role they played within organizations or they had you know a certain type of spin stereotype to them I think people understand the nuances now of comms and why it's important and um and and social um media and and beyond of of um of of propelled that forward really because crises happen immediately and comms is at the forefront of every Mm -hmm. company's strategy to to um to ensure that their reputation is is um, is positive or, or remains intact. So I think that 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 is changing. I agree with you, and I think that actually what you're saying about the NHS and and a seat on the board, I think actually in corporates they're probably a little bit behind on that. 
I don't oh, think yeah, yeah, there are right. yeah. enough people, um, senior comms people sat on company boards. When you think of the massive role that it plays within organisations now, um, that's something that definitely still needs to change. I'd love to know what the stats are on a person from the comms discipline becoming the CEO of a company. I'm, I'm, I bet there's... No there are a few. There'll, yeah. be, there'll be a lot more, you know, finance people. Uh, yeah, and engin- and software engineers. And software like engineers, yeah, than, 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 than comms people, absolutely. Well, actually, I think a very key part of a CEO now, absolutely in every way, is communicating with audiences and stakeholders, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. I feel this isn't my discipline either, but um, and I don't think it's really one that you guys touch on that much, or we now touch on as a whole business, but I think I would change the transparency on social media of some PR and marketing activities that are consistently made to look like they are organic, especially when it comes to marketing to teens and children and things like that. But that's probably a personal thing, I think. No, I agree with you 100%. Do you think that your clients have anything in common, not in terms of their hobbies, but in, in is there is there a typical client that you've worked with over the years and are working right. with her? I think, I think across Rue de Finn in general, no, because um, we work across every pretty much every industry that there is um, from... Um, you know, from consumer, big, you know, consumer organizations um, to healthcare, to, um, uh, to, to, to automotive to, and beyond everything. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and each market generally tends to have um, a stronger focus in one area. Our US team are brilliant at corporate comms. Our Asian team are, um, are and they, they do everything, but, but the corporate comms is something that they, they do much better than we do in the UK here. Yeah. Um, I think in, in Asia, you know, luxury um, and consumer is big for them. And, and in the UK, healthcare is probably the predominant thing. Yeah. But we also work with here, we work with um, organisations that aren't pure healthcare organisations. We work with National Grid. Mm-hmm. We work with uh, Avantium, uh, which is an, uh, a, a sustainable technology company. Mm-hmm. So um, there are lots of different things. I think the thing that, that links us together in the UK is science, is the communication of science, um, whether it be medical science, whether it be sustainability, you know, science, um, whether it is energy science, um, there are technical messages and developments and innovations that we help organisations to um, to communicate to <coughs> audiences and to adapt have, to different audiences. Have you ever had to put on a lab coat and a, and a beard snoot to visit a client site? no i've actually never done that i've never actually gone in there no that it's feels not, like a missed they opportunity would, generally they wouldn't let us in because it's it's got to be you know so um secure um, yeah clean, clean really. that they wouldn't want, want us potentially contaminating things but i've seen it um but no i haven't put on unfortunately i haven't put the lab coat on i think when i said that, we, that there's nothing that links all of our clients across the world i don't mean in terms of their industry actually the thing that links all of them is that they're all changing and adapting um, to the world, to the industries they, they work in, and trying to grasp the opportunities in front of them. And, mm-hmm. and it's our job to help them to, to, to do that, to use comms as a tool to be able to pivot and to change uh, and to develop and to go after um, mm-hmm. the, the opportunities in front of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What about you? I'd be trying to think about what my answer would be to this. I think what ours have in common is that they are trying to work with one of the most notoriously um, shy sectors there is when it comes to talking about the suppliers they use. Probably the only shyer sector is financials. So you try getting a bank to be a case study, it's almost impossible, but... um, because of the way procurement works with the public sector, our clients need our help to make sure that they are as uh, aware as possible of opportunities. And in some cases, when we're talking about new clients to the market, how the procurement process works and how best to showcase their activities. And I imagine it's like Rudolf Finn's current customer base, 
it will be all about the customer. So we do a lot of uh, turning customers into what we call engaged advocates so that all our clients have that in common. Um, I think they all have uh, hope in common. They all have hope for a more interoperable and joined up and efficient public sector that gives better, they, they, they want society to change in some way. So again, they would have that in, in common with yours. And um, they are all engaged in their processes with us. So it, it, it's often a really, you know, pretty wild ride when you start working with PR for the first time, as many of our, our, our clients were. And, and we, I think, I hope that they're all enjoying that process. And I think they also have our, my, our team in common, which is a good thing. The other thing is that they all have in some way a, a link to tech, right? Is to, to tech yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, Even if that's something that's, I mean, that's obviously obvious. That's obvious to you. But I think yeah. that that's one of the things. And reading recently about tech comms and tech PR, there's a there's a um, there's an assumption or there's a there's a, a th theory being put forward that the tech PR is dead that it doesn't yeah. you know, exist in the way that it used to anymore or even at all. So what do you think about that? Well, uh, sitting here as the grey beards of uh, of uh, technology PR that we both are technically, um, I think we would both agree that the technology PR we did twenty years ago is not the same as as as, as the PR now. You know, I would probably, uh, when I was 25, have been writing upwards of 14 press releases a week. There would, it would have been just constant push out of content to the media. But it would be a media where there was a reporter uh, on, say, IT Week that doesn't even exist anymore. There would have been an enterprise reporter, an SME reporter, a retail um, finance um, flipping e there would have been an e-commerce reporter at that time probably now the magazine doesn't exist none of those reporters exist and if they have stayed in journalism they've either broadened their horizons or they've moved on and started different more specialist publications yes it's definitely true that the tech PR that we were doing 20 years ago doesn't exist anymore and I agree with parts of that initial piece which was written by a journalist who was obviously very annoyed at at having to still do technology journalism and the PR work that comes with it. But I do agree that developing one's own channels as a business and making them as good as any magazine could be is the way forward. And we do that a lot with our clients. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, in no way can I accept that the career I've put my last 20 odd years into is dead. Don't be silly. I, I, I find it ironic that that's come from, you know, it, the, it, it was the, the media talking about that as journalists that actually started this debate yeah. when I know at least 20 you know, tech journalists who now work in PR. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we have a journalist in our ranks and you have a you have a journalist yeah. at Reader Fin. We know we're, we're, we are an agency staffed by ex-journalists and thank goodness for that because they're both great, aren't they? So um, it it's a good thing. But I think you know, in the last 20 years, what has changed about journalism? The clickbait headline. And there is a really good example of a clickbait headline. Yeah, exactly. So the next question, I don't know how, I, I've asked myself this question to, to test it and I, I'm going to try and give you an answer too. But I want to know, what can your team do better than you? Than me? Yeah. <laughs> that is a long list. <laughs> give us some of it. Um, I think so, you know, again, trying to be self-aware about this stuff. Um, what am I not good at? Um, quite a lot. Um, I'm not the most organized person in the world. Um, well, we've got I, that in common, haven't we? Good at starting things, not so good at finishing things. Um, yes. The delivery side of things um, has always been that kind of, you know, uh, that's not necessarily been a strength of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I have some people who are absolutely brilliant at, at that. Um, I think the if I look at how I got to here now, it was because there are a lot of good and bad things about places I've worked, but the good thing about where I started my career, Lewis, where I met you um, initially, was the fact that Chris, who runs the agency, always um, kind of saw me as an individual 
and um, changed my path according to my strengths and skills. He didn't mm -hmm. just expect everybody to be an AE, SAE, AM, SAM, you know, and go up the chain and do the same thing. So um, from one thing I take away from that, um, there are lots of good things, good and bad, that I take away from that. But one good thing is that, you know, that you should play to people's strengths. You mm -hmm. shouldn't expect everybody to be an all-rounder. No, you, should, uh, you shouldn't actually sit in an appraisal and say, these are the things you do great, but you have to work on all of these things and change them so that you are a fully rounded human being. Completely. Really focus on the strengths, really focus on the things that people are good at. And I think that there are, everybody in the company has something that they're better than me at, everyone. And I think that's the strength of the organisation, recognising that, harnessing that and, and developing that. Couldn't agree more. Um my answer is that I think that my team is better at honesty than I am. And I, that's a controversial answer. Well, uh, maybe honesty isn't the right. Uh, okay, I, I have to put that in context. They're better at speaking out, calling things out, telling me how they feel telling me what they want than I would ever have been. And I consider that to be a massive privilege. And I also consider it to be something that I have to learn how to do better. Um, you know, again, not to keep referring back to it, but because we've both been in the industry for the same amount of time, we have both probably witnessed more corporate bad behavior than we ever needed to um, from every aspect of our professional lives and we've also probably missed opportunities where we could have or we or other people could have like you say put um put you on a different path or supported somebody who needed to go on a different path yeah. And I feel like Mantis is built now by people who just don't let that happen anymore. Um, you know, group chat is a better place for it. Um, the kind of things we share with each other are a better place for it. Personal development, personal development plans are a better place for it because people have the courage to say, you know what, I don't feel like I can do this today or I feel like for my career development, like you say, I'd be better off doing this. This isn't my thing. You no longer have to bash against that brick wall and um, you know, the world is a more is a better place for being more diverse and inclusive of all types of communicators. And I think my team embodies that much better than I ever did. And I'm glad to be leading them. I, think I agree, and I think that diversity. I think diversity, inclusion are. Um, obviously at the forefront of every company, uh, every company's vision about how they operate going forward uh, and deservedly so, but I do think there's a lot of lip service paid to it. And I think that the, the best way of approaching it is to let everybody be um, the person that they are and play to mm -hmm. their strengths and, and develop the areas they want to develop and, and, and um, help them to enjoy their job. It's not just about, you know, um, in terms of diversity, according to, to, um, to, to, to race and to um, and to, to uh, sexuality and, and, and everything else. Um, it's also about personality and skills. And I think that's a really important thing that um, organisations need to understand when they're developing these strategies. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely agreed. So if you could take yourself back to being a grad, um, this isn't a stupid question. But you did go to uni, didn't you? I don't know if you did. Yes, I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you could take yourself back to being in that sort of graduate trainee type role, what what would you be looking to learn in your first job? Because now it's not then when we were looking for our first job, I think it was about what could be taken from us, what could we offer? But now it's about what are we looking for, really? Mm -hmm. Much I think so. Ever. So I think I remember. So when I when I joined my first job, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't have a burning ambition to be in comms. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, I kind of had a vague notion of wanting to be a journalist as yeah, a lot of I people who fell into this industry did, right? At that time. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and it, it just I applied for loads of jobs and this was the one I got and I struggled massively at the start because I didn't have office skills and office skills you know being able to fax a document being able to you know format um, a word document all of these things that are just so basic I didn't do I didn't write I, I hand wrote my essays at uni that kind of dates me massively yeah, and but I mean the, the, this this sort of stuff was very different then it was but now one of the reasons that we do a lot on GDocs is because most of the people at Mantis now grew up on GDocs. Totally. So, so it's a very different, it's a very different thing. I think that, that, that side of things, knowing how to learn and adapt to working in a kind of office environment with, with tech, using technology, uh, stuff, they don't, that, that's not something that, they, that there's, a, there's a huge learning path now. People are called natives. They, they understand the stuff, they use it. Um, mm-hmm. when, you know, um, my, my boy does. Mm. You know, he understands, you know, so much more now at the age of 12 than I did when I was starting a job. So yeah. it's, um, it, 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 that, that's not an area that they really need to develop skills in. Um, I massively floundered when I when I started. I almost got sacked very quickly for messing up quite a lot and not really and being very naive about um, how work operates. Um, but then a, then a kind of a switch flicked and, and, and I got it. Um, I think. Um, what I what I would what I would do if I was if I was starting a role now is to not pigeonhole myself, not box myself in. I think because you know, you have that basis of understanding how technology works and, and how to use it, um, you know that's covered. It should be about learning what you like, what you're good at, um, mm-hmm. trying to try different things, test them out, uh, and seeing which directions it will lead you in. I don't think it should be about trying to specialise too quickly um, or saying that you're this or that and this is where you want to be. I think you should give it a few years in work to understand um, where your path lies and, and, and what's best suited to you. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Um... And I think that the point, the point I was making about almost getting sacked early is because, um, not because I did anything terrible, I just wasn't very used to that environment um and i think um you know i think people are um people are different people take time to adapt and change and you have to give them that leeway when they start to find themselves and to find their way um and 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 that's all part of that process i think i would i would look for i'd be looking to learn about giving and receiving feedback because one of the things I found hardest when I first started in comms was having my work fed back on by everybody and feeling that well at first indignant because obviously I'm awesome but then letting it beat me down letting me letting myself think that because my boss and two clients had gone through what I'd written and changed things that I hadn't done a good a a good job that that the starting point was wasn't right and I would be looking to learn collaborative working a little bit quicker probably and it's but but it's 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 very different to the way that feedback has been given to you throughout your education life right so you know, at school, you give in, you give in homework, and then it gets marked, and it comes back to you, and it's never in huge amounts of detail. It's general yeah. comments. When you come into work, the feedback is thick and fast, it's immediate, and it's and it's constant. And yeah, I agree with you. Adapting to that is a is a difficult thing to do, and reacting positively to it is a difficult thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I only learn. It was actually becoming a parent that taught me the art of. You probably remember this when your kids were small you know, somebody be having a problem with something and you don't want to go in there and go, what you need to do is this. What you would always say is what really worked for us was, because then you're not saying you do, you need to do that. Yeah. And really, I, 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 once you start to get that feedback loop going, it starts to feel a bit more positive, doesn't it? I and think- again, it comes down to what we were saying earlier. You don't want to just create identity of people. You want no. to be, we want people to do things with their own personality stamp and their own way of doing things. You know, yeah. Um, on it you don't want to just try to make everybody the same so if you start trying to impose these things um and these processes and rules and ways of working you know, um too heavy-handedly then 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 that's what you're doing you're you're, you're pushing people down that route mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i'll look forward to you um proofing and editing my work that'll be good old times standard stuff that'll be awesome yeah 
Yeah, we'll, we'll revisit this conversation once that's happened. <laughs> yeah. we'll see how we react to it. <laughs> just fax me, just fax it to me, because obviously we're home with our fax machine fax, now. So. Fax, fax. <laughs> fax machine was my nemesis at the start. Do you remember uh, Fax Maker when you just fed yeah. one fax in and then that you changed said- my? Oh no, when desktop faxing was was changed my life. You could you could fax a document from your desktop rather than printing it off and feeding it in a machine. Amazing. And the groundbreaking Brighton technology. Argus, Brighton Argus always got your press release fifty times because Fax Maker always got stuck on the first yeah. thing it came to. They must have hated PR so much. That article about is tech PR dead is probably by the Brighton Argus. And the length of time it used to take to churn out the other end as well, having the 50, ones, 50, 50 faxes coming through. Yes, it must have been terrible. On that bombshell from the 90s, um, we've um, been talking for quite a while now, so uh, I think we should probably uh, close it here. But it's been really cool talking to you. I hope that it's given all our clients and all our team a bit of a flavour of you know, what we're thinking. And I certainly would be happy to revisit this podcast in a couple of months and um, with some invited questions from our teams and our clients and I can tell by your face that you absolutely love that idea no I'm not um, going to watch this ever again I can't see why anyone would want to watch 50 minutes of me talking but um you'll but be yeah, surprised we can do that. it's fine for marketing <laughs> purposes you'll be surprised well by the end by the end of next year we will probably have a weekly ask Eleanor and Nick anything podcast where we're getting celebrities to you know you think we'll be famous oh god yeah absolutely I don't see any reason why not. For a start, we work in public relations. We've got no excuse not to promote this so well that we become famous. And secondly, I don't think anybody would describe us as having faces for radio. We, we're, we're born to be in, in a video podcast. You speak for yourself. I will, and I do. I've got my Thank niche, though, my ni- 90s, 90s PR. I think that's, <laughs> that's something we can probably we can own. I don't see anyone else owning it at the moment. That could be a new client package that we offer. Would you yeah. like PR from now or would you like PR from the 90s? Because we've got yeah. a really good 90s PR team. A reduced budget, but we have to actually, yeah, deliver it via I'll those wear, mechanisms, yeah. I'll wear my maroon collarless trouser suit. With sounds spe- I think you should do that for the next podcast anyway. I will. <laughs> As if it fit. Right, Okay. Really nice to speak to you. Probably will speak to you in about half an hour in some other context. Yeah. Thank you for joining our podcast. It's been a pleasure. Nick Leonard, goodbye. See you later.